Well, thank you very much, Joe. And um, Codemash is pretty great. I got this keychain there last year, which was a 3D printed keychain they gave away. I don't know if it was just the speakers or what, but it's a great conference, my favorite. So I highly recommend submitting and or attending. All right, so tonight we're talking about NoSQL and .NET. If I can get this to work. And he just showed you this information, but for the record, this is where we are, Dayton, Ohio. This is more for me than it is for you guys, just so I know where, where I'm at. And there's the links that he shared up there for, for the Dayton uh, .NET developers group. Here's some information about me. Again, this is more for my benefit, so I can remember who I am. Um, but uh, I'm on Twitter there, M. Groves. I work for Couchbase, so that's your disclaimer. That's why I'm talking about Couchbase tonight. Uh, I have a podcast and a blog at crosscuttingconcerns.com. If you guys want to be on a podcast, talk about something that you, you know, some technical topic you're interested in, let me know. I'd love to have you on. I have some really impressive acronyms. In fact, we should end the session right now on a high note on how great those acronyms are. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The acronyms, whatever, but the quote down there is really what I, sort of my uh, philosophy when it comes to sessions like this, is that I'm up here, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you, but I'm not an expert. I'm just an enthusiast. I'm learning about the technology. I want to tell you guys about it. I'm not an all-knowing guru. So please, if you have questions during the session, just stop and ask me. If I say anything confusing, doesn't make sense, or if you just want to dive in a little deeper, we've got a relatively small group here, so that's totally fine. I, I'm be willing to do that. Have some flexibility. Let's get this out of the way, because this always comes up. I work for Couchbase. It's not CouchDB. They have the same, they share an acronym, the Couch acronym. Um, and they're both NoSQL databases. They both have some roots early on. Some of the same people contributed to the, the projects. But CouchDB is not a fork of Couchbase and vice versa. They're totally different technologies. CouchDB is the Apache Foundation, and Couchbase is Couchbase Incorporated. All right? So I just want to get that out of there because it always comes up, so I figured I'd just get ahead of it. And speaking of stickers, I have a bunch over here. Not a bunch, but a, a select few stickers here. So if you guys want to tweet something interesting with hashtag Couchbase, a picture, um, I would appreciate that so my boss knows I'm here working and not screwing around. Uh, and I'll give you a sticker afterwards. Or if you don't have a Twitter account, just ask nice, I'll give you a sticker afterwards. Okay. We're talking about full stack development and NoSQL. So right off the bat, some of you might have problems with some of these buzzwords in this, in this topic here. And I'm with you on this. Uh, the full stack buzzword is one that people criticize a lot because, well, you're not writing OS level code. You're not writing driver software. Is it really a full stack? Well, no. What we mean is the full stack of the application, right? So the application code and maybe some code to deploy it to your servers or your cloud or whatever. So it's sort of a shortcut term, and I get it. It's not really full stack, but that's the shortcut term we use. And NoSQL. This is a term that I hate, and I work for a NoSQL company because it really describes what it's not. It doesn't describe what it is. And as I'm going to show you later on today, it's becoming more and more, or less and less accurate. So, um, but it's a nice uh, marketing shortcut. And if I didn't use the shortcut terms, the topic would be more like this, which doesn't quite roll off the tongue in the same way. So um, I'm going to use those terms. Hopefully you guys don't mind. You forgive me for those. All right, so we're talking about full stack. And if you're a full stack developer, you're probably somewhere in the middle there, some combination of these things. You work on the, with the database. You work on a front end, whether that's a, a web app or a mobile app or whatever, you're working on the front end. You're doing some business logic on the back end. And you're also possibly deploying to infrastructure using Docker containers or cloud deploy, or you're just you know, deploying to your own servers. So you're doing some combination of those things. So is anybody in here, does this describe anybody at all? Nobody? You guys don't know what I'm talking about? OK. All right. So when we're talking about application stacks, what you often see is you see these acronyms over here on the left side. You see the LAMP stack, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And the mean stack, which is Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node. And those are, you know, the exact technologies in there don't really matter too much, but it does represent kind of two different approaches to writing a, a web app. You know, you have LAMP, which is very server-side heavy, and you have mean, which has your segregated UI, so everything lives in, in the browser and makes requests to the back end via an API. 
so it's very segregated there. But basically those stacks just mean some combination of those things. I don't have a zippy acronym for the .NET version, unfortunately, because um, it would be like, um, oh, we'll, we'll talk about that later, I guess. Uh, and so why is NoSQL appealing to people who are writing these sort of modern mean stacks? And this is something to do with it. Oftentimes, when you're creating endpoints, your web services, what you're rendering, what you're returning is something like this, a complete JSON document that contains some combination of, of data that helps you render a UI, render an interface or a form. And to create that, you often have to go to your relational database, join together a lot of tables. In many cases, you almost always join those tables together to, to use them to your endpoint. So people who did this said, well, why should I be always going through and doing all these joins? Why don't I just store this in the database? That way I don't have to do that extra work. And so that's one of the reasons that people like to use NoSQL with um, these, these, newer, these newer stacks. The benefit is you also get the, the ability to store your data in multiple ways. So this is a JSON object, which gives you a lot of flexibility on how you want to store your data. And you're denormalizing it, which is what I just mentioned there. And then you get a dynamic schema. So if you make changes to your schema, you can just change the way you save the document. There's no fixed schema here. You don't have to add a new column, update a table, run a migration script, and so on. So where is NoSQL a good fit? That's a question that people ask a lot. The answer is I don't have a silver bullet answer for you. It's not always a good fit, and it's not always a bad fit. The same goes for any tool, really, relational database and otherwise. These are sort of the traditional use cases you see mentioned when people talk about NoSQL. Um, to quote uh, Jim Holmes, if you guys are familiar with him, uh, the best practice is to use your brain. So it's a good fit in those modern applications typically. If you're doing some legacy stuff or some highly transactional uh, relational stuff, probably you're going to have a bad time in NoSQL. Um, but you can use a combination. You can use relational and NoSQL in the same application, no less. So I'm going to talk about Couchbase tonight. Couchbase is a NoSQL database. A lot of people come to Couchbase because it has a built-in managed cache layer in it. So you're often pulling documents or writing documents directly to and from RAM instead of having to make a disk request each time. So a lot of people use Couchbase just for that. They'll have a relational database and then they'll do some operations and store it in Couchbase to use it as a very quick access cache. Couchbase can also act as a very simple key value store. And um, mainly what I'm going to talk about tonight is the document database portion of Couchbase, uh, which is where we have the JSON documents being stored in there. And Couchbase also has some embedded database and sync management tools, which we can talk about tonight if we have time, if you guys are interested. Couchbase would like to say that it, with NoSQL you get agility and scale. Excuse me. So these are the uh, agility bullet points. Um, we talked about some of the flexible schema things. With querying, with Couchbase, you have several options on querying. We'll talk about getting data out today. Uh, if anybody here uses big data, Couchbase integrates well with a lot of those big data tools you've seen, like uh, Spark and Hadoop and Kafka and all those. And as far as scaling goes, this is another one of the, the things that a NoSQL database can give you, is that you can just add more machines and you can reduce machines as you need them. So if it's a busy time of year, if it's a Black Friday, or if it's back to school time, you can add more scale and scale back when that period is over. Some other cool features like multi-data center deployment. So if you have a data center on the East Coast and the West Coast, you can replicate between them with Couchbase fairly easily. Some great administration tools, which we'll have a, a little bit of a look at today, and enterprise-grade security you're used to seeing. I'm going to be talking about .NET and C Sharp tonight, but Couchbase SDKs are available for pretty much all the popular languages and frameworks. Um, Java, Node, it's all there. Uh, frameworks, I'm going to be using Web API tonight, but it's going to work just fine with MVC, with Nancy, with whatever else you want to use. Nothing framework specific about it. Uh, I'm going to also be showing you on Windows tonight. But you can also install it on a Mac, you can install it on Linux. It works fine in Amazon Web Services, in Azure, in Docker, all those, all those great things. You can deploy Couchbase to it. And big data, as I mentioned, lots of integrations with big data that are available if you guys are into any of the big data stuff. 
So these just are a few that our customers are using or are trying out right now. Let's talk about the Couchbase server architecture really briefly. This is just a high level overview. So we've kind of already established that your full stack developer does some of the DevOps type things. So it's good to know this type of information. Each node in the Couchbase cluster is of equal importance. So there's no like master slave, there's no primary secondary. Every node in the cluster is sort of on the same importance level. Um, now you can, so each node for instance has storage, has cache, has replication. Those services at the top for data, query, and indexing, those can be scaled differently if you, if you want to. If you have a very query intensive application, you may want to put that query service on two or three nodes that have a very beefy processor. And that's that sort of thing. Uh, so your data service is going to be building your local view indexes. Your indexing engine is going to be doing the global indexes, which uh, I like a lot. We'll talk about those some. And the query engine is actually going to do the, the planning and the coordinating and executing of the queries. Um, now, as a developer, you don't have to worry about this too much because you're going to be mainly interacting with the cluster manager, which is going to be responsible for figuring out which node to pull the document from, to store it on, et cetera. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I have to make a request to this node or this node. That's all handled by the cluster manager and the SDK. And the cluster manager also provides a nice the REST API if you need to use the REST API. This is a screenshot of the Couchbase console. So when you install Couchbase server, you just get a, a nice little uh, website that comes with it. You can go here to see just the dashboard of all your nodes, all the memory that's been allocated, the status of them, and so on. Uh, we'll see this in action later on uh, today. And the REST API, so you can use the REST API to do some sort of scripting or some other advanced stuff you want to do that you can't necessarily, don't necessarily want to use you know, just in the UI console. You can make requests to that cluster. Okay, so let's talk about how to actually get data out of Couchbase. And there are three main ways, and some of these are pretty common to NoSQL databases. So one of them is key access. So each document in Couchbase has the document itself. It also has a key. And so one way is I can say, okay, I have this key, K2. Give me the document for K2. And Couchbase says, okay, here's a document for K2. This operation is the most basic, fundamental, and very fast operation of Couchbase because most of the time you're going to be making a request. It's going to be in memory. It's going to return you the document from memory. No uh, indexing required, no um, disk writing or disk access required. It's just going to give you the document almost immediately. Um, and those are evenly distributed across the cluster, by the way. And that's, so you get a, sort of an automatic sharding going on there. So you say, give me K2. The cluster manager figures out which node that's on very quickly and then gives you that document from that node. Another way, so, so that's, that's a pretty simple way to do it because you're just getting it by a key. But what if you need like a group of documents or, or some sort of query over the documents? So one way that's pretty common for NoSQL systems is a, um, to create some sort of view that uses a static query. And we often see these in the form of MapReduce. Anybody familiar with MapReduce? Yeah, okay. So if you're not, it's just imagine this scenario here. I've got uh, three people, they're documents. I'm going to map them to get some properties of those documents, in this case the name and the age. I'm going to reduce. I want, I want only those uh, documents that have an age over 21. So I reduce it to just Steve and Alyssa. So with Couchbase Server, you can write these and install them on your, server, on your clusters themselves, and you write them in the form of JavaScript. So you write a map function and a reduce function, and they, they're stored on the Couchbase cluster. So that's pretty common among NoSQL databases, not just Couchbase. Uh, here's something that's maybe a little less common with NoSQL databases, is that you can actually use SQL to get documents out of them. Uh, so in Couchbase, we call it nickel. N1QL because it's a superset of SQL. It's more than just SQL because we're not dealing with just rows of data and tables. We're dealing with documents that have JSON in them. So we need some extra stuff to handle special cases of JSON. But here's a very simple example. I can just say select star from bucket where age is greater than 21. That goes to Couchbase and returns back Steve and Melissa. 
So if you guys know SQL, you're comfortable with SQL, you guys are going to be comfortable with nickel. So you see why no SQL term is not as accurate as it once was. Um, so this is a simple example, but you can also do joins. Uh, you can do where, like, group, all those sorts of things. There's some really powerful extensions on this that, that make it a superset. So we have a JSON document that contains hierarchies or arrays. And so you need to be able to unnest those sometimes or, or nest them, as the case may be. There's also some ODBC and JDBC drivers available that will translate into Nickel. So you can hook it up to your business intelligence tools like Excel or whatever and just get out a standard result from those drivers. Okay, so we're going to talk about the .NET SDK tonight. I'm going to show you a very simple .NET based application with some Angular, some Web API, and Couchbase as the backing store. The Couchbase SDK is available on NuGet, so if you just search for Couchbase .NET Client. Do you have a question? Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, this is compatible right now with the full .NET framework. The .NET Core version is coming very, very soon. It's all open source, so you can check out the status of that if you want to. Uh, it's getting very, very close. I'm getting excited because I, I really wanted to get into that .NET Core stuff. Okay, so uh, once you have Couchbase Server installed, which is a very quick install, and once you have included that SDK with NuGet, you're ready to go and start writing some, some code here. So these are some namespaces that you might bring in uh, to use Couchbase. These are just some snippets. We're going to see some more complete code in a, in a minute here, but um, can everybody read that in the back okay? Okay. So you want to first connect to a cluster. You want to get a connection. And the way you do that is by you new up this client configuration object, and you tell that object where your nodes are. So you have to give it at least one node. In my case, I'm only running one node locally on my machine. So I'm just giving it one address, couchbase colon slash slash localhost. If I had multiple nodes, I would give it a whole list of them right there. And then I can use the cluster helper to say, go ahead and initialize the helper with this configuration. And then from that point on, you can use cluster helper in your application. So typically that first part there is done in startup, like application start. The next part is we want to connect to a, a bucket. Now, a bucket is a storage mechanism in Couchbase where you put your documents. So a bucket contains lots of documents. And the documents don't have to have anything in common. They can be different types of documents. Um, but they do have to have a unique key within that bucket. So you can't have two documents with the same key in one bucket. Typically, a rule of thumb is you want to have one bucket per application. You can use multiple if you want to, but that's just sort of the rule of thumb. So it's not really a database, but it's not really a table. It's sort of somewhere in between that if you're, if you're thinking relational analogies. Uh, okay, the next thing is how you would start preparing a nickel query. There's a query request class, and you say dot .create. You pass it a, a string, and then you can use that to do parameterization and execute it and get results and so on. We'll see more of that later today. But that's just sort of the, the very basic getting ready. And the last part here is we want to actually create a document and save it to Couchbase. So there is a document type that comes with the Couchbase SDK. And I'm just getting a new instance of that there. And I'm going to call it document of type dynamic because I'm super lazy and didn't want to put a class in there. But I probably should in a real application. Two things you need for a document at least is you need the key, which is the ID. Um, value there. I'm just calling it my dash key. And the document itself, which in this case is an anonymous object because, again, lazy. You could just put a regular plain old uh, .NET object in there. That would be fine. And that's going to get deserialized into JSON, or is it serialized into JSON anyway. Um, so once you have that document, you pass it to the bucket.insert method, and that's saved into Couchbase. That's the most basic Thing you can do. There's lots of other options and things. So any questions on that so far? Okay. All right, so here is another example of the sort of thing I'm going to show you tonight. I'm going to be using async and await. Anybody really comfortable with those yet in C-sharp? Async and await. 
Good, because I'm not either, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So you guys won't be able to trick me. OK, uh, but you don't have to use async. You can use synchronous. There's, there's no reason you can't. There's, both are available on Couchbase. So I'll go through this one line by line here. We'll start with uh, signature. It's an async method, so I mark it async, and it's going to return a task. And since I'm returning something, I'm going to make it dynamic because, again, lazy. Uh, but you could put a list of some object in there, whatever you want to do. And then the parameter I'm expecting is a string, which contains some SQL query or nickel query. I'm going to pass that into my query request.create, and I'll get a query to run from that. That's a, um, oh, I'm not sure what, it, what the type is. I think I query request or something. So I'll get that. Then I will call the bucket, which is not pictured here, but it's actually a member of the class, and query async. Or I could use query if I wanted to do a synchronous version. And again, I'm passing dynamic. I'm going to wait for the results from that. The results object is going to contain some things like, uh, was it successful? Was there an error code? And in my case, I'm interested in just the results themselves. So I'm going to get the rows of information. Even though it's not rows, it's documents. But it's the, the property is called rows. And that's going to be returned from my method. OK, so any questions on that so far? Looking pretty straightforward, looking good. OK, I'm going to switch over now to uh, a demo here. Oop, got locked out somehow because I'm pushing the wrong shortcut. That's why. OK, P. That's what I want. OK, and looks like I forgot to open the project. so. Stand by for a second here. This code is all available on GitHub. I'll give you a link for it later. So I'm not going to go over every single line of code today. Um, so you can investigate it yourself later on. But we will go through some of it. Just want to show you now this application that I've built in action. And take you through a quick demo of it. And then we'll come back and look at the code for that. Come on, Visual Studio. You can do it. This is why I want to get into that .NET Core stuff, because the Visual Studio Code, have you guys tried that IDE yet? It just fires up like that. It's not quite the same thing, but uh, super quick. OK. So what I've got here is a very, very simple CRUD app. If you guys can't really see that very well, can you? OK. So this is just going to be a list of users, right? So right now, there's nothing in the Couchbase database. I'll hit new item, and I'll say Matt Groves. And there's my Couchbase address. You're welcome to email me if you want to. And I'll hit save, and that shows up in my grid there. And I can keep adding more and more if I wanted to. I can also edit one of them and say Matt Groves. And that change happens there. Pretty standard sort of CRUD thing. I can hit delete, and there's no confirmation because, again, super lazy. So it just deletes the, re the record automatically or immediately. But let me add it back in here so you can see. Um, oops. There we go. So I'll go over here to my Couchbase uh, console. If I go to Data Buckets, I have a bucket here called Default. That's the one I'm using for this, uh, this sample. You can see there's one document in there. I'll hit Documents. And there is the document. So the key is just some uh, arbitrary GUID that I generated. And there's the actual document, which is JSON. If I click on that, you can see sort of JSON object you'd expect with first name, last name, email, and that type user in there, which we'll talk about uh, in a second here as well. So but that's, that's the demo there. That's, um, that's all this is. This is using Angular on the UI side. Angular is just making calls to the web API backend, which is in turn making calls to, it's doing some business logic and also making calls to Couchbase. So that's the, that's the full stack there. Any questions on that before I go back over to these slides? We can always come back to the code later. Okay, cool. So, um, 
So we like to promote this Keen stack idea because the mean stack is using Mongo, so the Keen stack is using Couchbase. That's probably, if you guys are .NET developers, that's probably you don't care about that because that's Express, that's Node. Um, so instead of Express, I'm using Web API. Instead of Node, I'm using ASP.NET and IIS. Doesn't quite make a very good acronym. I mean, it's like Ka or ka Kawa, um, Waka. I don't know. It's just nothing, nothing good there. So that's the stack. I don't know. It's whatever stack. Um, so this is that separation I was talking about before. We have the Angular, in this case it's Angular 1, Angular JS front end, and we have the back end. And the only thing that really couples them together is the, is the definition of the APIs, you know, what URLs they are and what the data is they return. So I could switch these around. If I wanted to switch to Angular 2, hypothetically I wouldn't have to change my back end and vice versa. Or, even more to the point, you could share that API amongst different applications. So my web app, sure, but I could also write a mobile app that uses the same set of endpoints, or I don't know, an Xbox app, or a tablet app, or whatever else. Use that same, same uh, different front ends with the same back end. So speaking of back end, let's take a look at the web API back end. Anybody in here done any work with web API yet, or MVC? All right, good, good. It's not terribly complicated. So we're going to look at some of the code of that demo app I just showed you. We'll start with the web.config, which is the most exciting part of any app. I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, I've added two app settings in here. One points to the server, uh, which is just a node in a cluster. In my case, it's only one node, but uh, node in a cluster. And the bucket name, which actually mine's default, but it's called restful sample here. You can change the bucket to whatever you want. Um, so that's just in the app config. Nothing crazy there. Here's the global ASAX code. So if you've seen this before, these top five lines should look pretty familiar to you. Boilerplate when you get file new. The second part here is the more interesting couch-based configuration stuff. So like I showed you before, client configuration, I'm passing the URL from the config file I just showed you into that object. SSL is off because I don't have a certificate set up locally. And then um, initialize my cluster helper. So from this point on, I can use Cluster Helper to connect to that um, cluster and do some stuff with Couchbase. All right. And then and it's a good idea to close that Cluster Helper in your application end so when your app recycles or whatever, you won't have any problems with connections and things like that. Okay, so now we've got that set up. Let's build a controller, an API controller. I've got one here called RESTful Controller, and it's an API controller because it inherits from it up there. Um, I'm going to new up a new record model, which I haven't shown you yet, but we'll get to that code as well. Just gonna store that as a uh, field in the class. And I recommend you use some sort of IOC for this, like structure map or dependency injection of some sort. But just to keep things simple, I'm going to omit that from, the, from this example. I hope you'll forgive me. Okay, and now let's do an endpoint. So finally, we've done the configuration. We have Couchbase server set up. Let's do an endpoint. So uh, this is the save endpoint. So this is what will get posted to when I want to save a new person document. I've, I'm using the route attribute up there to specify the URL for this endpoint. You don't have to do that. I think it is nice for these type of examples where it's, you know, I'm showing you a demonstration and that's the URL. You can use some routing rules instead. That's, that's up to you. It's a post. So I'm saying HTTP post. Asynchronous again, it's going to return an HTTP action result. This is going to be something like a 200 or a, a 400 or some other sort of HTTP code plus the actual body of the response. And then I'm expecting a post body of, to get mapped to that person class. So I've created a person class that has first name, last name, email, fields, so I'm depending on the model binder to do that work of, hey, here's what's being posted. Okay, let's map that into an a object of type person. One of my favorite things about Web API and MVC. Doing some very, very basic validation. Um, just to show you that, you know, this is one thing you might want to do with your, with your endpoints. Probably want more complex validation than this or put it in some other class, but it's as, it's as good for demonstration. 
So I'm just saying that all those fields must be required and filled out, otherwise we're going to return a bad request, which is 400, and this is going to be the body of the, the bad request um, you know, message. And then assuming it passes validation, I'm going to just take that body object and save it with my model.save method, which I haven't written yet, so don't worry. And I'm going to await that because this is asynchronous and return an OK, which is code 200, I believe. OK? Good so far? OK, here's another endpoint. This is a git endpoint. So we want to actually get a document. So if we're going to edit, for instance, we want to first get the existing document, display it to the user in the form, allow them to make changes, and then they'll post back to that save endpoint which I guess I should, uh, oh. let me just go back to here and say that this is an endpoint that's going to be both for creating new documents and for updating existing documents. So that will come back and play later. But anyway, very simple here. I'm just expecting a document ID to be, to be passed in, which is a GUID. I've chosen for those to be GUIDs. They don't have to be. It could be a string, a number, whatever you want those keys to be. And if the one's not passed in, then this is a bad request, and you have to give me a document ID. Otherwise, we'll say, okay, I got a document ID. Let's go and find that document. And so I'll call model.document. These endpoints are really just acting as traffic cops. They're not doing much themselves. I don't want to have Couchbase-specific stuff in my endpoints. I don't want to have you know, my database access logic in here. I just want to have, okay, get the request, validate it, you know, send it off to a service, and then return to the user. It's just a traffic cop. Keep those, uh, keep those endpoints very thin. Here's a delete endpoint. Hopefully you're starting to see a pattern here. I've chosen to use post for this. You can use a delete, HTTP delete instead. That's totally fine. That's up to you. And same sort of thing, but now I'm passing it into the delete method here of, the, of the, that class, which we haven't written yet. Okay. So let's look at that, recordmodel.cs. We're going to actually start implementing some Couchbase specific stuff here. This is the save method, which as I said before, is going to handle both inserts and updates. So the way I do that in this case is, maybe this is kind of some scary syntax if you haven't been up on the new C-sharp stuff, so I'll walk you through it. It's not that, that uh, difficult, I don't think, hopefully. So what, I'm, what I need with the document is, again, an ID and the actual document, the content of the document. So in this case, I'm saying, okay, look at the data object, look at the document ID in there. And then the question mark dot is some new stuff in C-sharp that says, if that's not null, then go ahead and execute the to string. Otherwise, it's going to return null. So the left part here, from this part over, if document ID is not specified, it's going to be null. And then the right part here, I say, okay, give me a new GUID and make that a string. So if the left part's null, that double question mark there says, okay, use the right part instead. So in either case, I'm going to end up with some GUID in that ID field, whether it's an ID of a document that already exists or a brand new ID because we're creating a brand new person. Okay, everybody follow that so far? It's really, there's kind of two operations there that some people aren't really comfortable with sometimes, but it's nice and succinct. It's a really nice, clean line of code, so that's why I do it. Uh, okay, and then the content is, I, I could just pass the data object right into content if I wanted to do that, but what I want to do is kind of map those one by one, because I might want to do some sort of transformation on those, or maybe someone adds a new field to the person class that I didn't know about, and I don't want that stored in the database necessarily, so I'm just doing it one by one. Uh, and I'm also adding a new field in there called type. So I'm, there's nothing special about a field called type. I could call it, you know, um, foo if I wanted to. But this is a way for me, because there's no schema in my database, to say this document is of type user. So then I can do some things like, oh, just give me all the user documents from this bucket, or give me all the invoice documents from this bucket. So I'm just sort of marking it as a user type. This is not the only way to do that sort of thing with Couchbase, but it's, it's a common way to do it, to just put another field in there that separates it from other types of documents. 
And finally, once I have the document, I'm going to perform an upsert operation. Now, based on the name, maybe you understand what that does. It's update plus insert, sort of crash together. So if the document key already exists, it's going to do an update. If that document key does not exist, it's going to do an insert. So that's what upsert means, update plus insert. And that's it. That's saved into the database. So if I were to save content with this person, yeah. uh, it would just save all the kind of serializable things. Yes, it would, it would serialize that person object. Mm -hmm. Exactly. OK, and so we already saw what that looks like. It looks something like this with a GUID and uh, the fields there in the document. Okay, now let's look at the get by document ID method, which we could have in our record model. And I'm just sort of showing off nickel here in this example. There's actually an operation that on the bucket object itself to get by document ID, which is much faster. Recommend that you use that instead. But this is a cool way for me to show off some very simple nickel. So I decided to do it that way. So I'm going to get by document ID. My documents are, have, you know, they have a GUID as a key. So I'm going to write some SQL here that just says, give me those fields from the documents, from the bucket name, which is not displayed here, but it's set in the constructor to, what is it, default or RESTful sample, whatever it was. I'm going to alias that as users, just like you can do in, in standard SQL. And then I'm going to say, give me some metadata about the document like the, the key, the document key. And that's going to equal some parameter I'm going to pass in there. Dollar sign one equals parameter. And then I say, okay, do a query request, and I get an I query request object, which I can then use to add parameters, because guess what? NoSQL database, still vulnerable to SQL injection. Uh, and then I say query async, and again, dynamic because I'm lazy, query. This could easily be person instead of dynamic, if I wanted to. And then, uh, because there are other fields like success and error and things like that, I return r.rows, which is actually the list of person objects. So if I was going to do, if I was going to make this more strongly typed, I'd say person here, and I'd say task list of person up there as the return type. Okay, we'll see some more advanced nickel later, but I wanted to give this a real basic example, so if you have any questions, we can address those before we continue on with that. All right. Cool. Some more new C-sharp syntax, so I hope this is not scaring you too much, overwhelming you, but here's a delete method in my record model. I'm just taking the document ID, and I'm calling the remove method, which takes in a key, and I'm passing in the key to remove it. So the new syntax here is this little arrow here. In place of the method body and a return, you just use the arrow. So in case you're not familiar with that, you could also do this, the exact same thing. Just a little more concise. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to move on to Angular now. So if you have questions about C Sharp, we can talk about it now or Come back to it later. All right. I'm not much of an Angular guy. Um, I'm not sure if I like Angular or not. I have a weird relationship with it. But here, this is AngularJS. This is the original Angular. This is not the new TypeScript one. I'm just going to scratch the surface of Angular here tonight. I'm not get into it too much. And nothing magical about Angular. You could use React or um, Ember or whatever else people are using that just got invented yesterday. Uh, so here is a, this is an Angular app.js file. So I have uh, a fetch all method I'm adding to the scope. I've been told this is not the best way to do it, but whatever. And then all this function does is make a, a git call to our endpoint, which is API git all, which I don't think I showed you the code for, but it's there in the, in the sample. And then using JavaScript promises, we have the success here. So once that git call is successful, I'm going to take the results loop through the result, because it's going to be a JSON uh, result, and add those to a scope.items property, where the key is going to be the key of the document, and the value is going to be the value of the document. So then I can use that scope.items in my Angular markup to display those on the screen, which you saw earlier. 
All right. And then similarly, if I have a save method in Angular, it's just going to make a post call to that API endpoint. I believe data is the reserved term for the post body that you're going to post to your endpoint. Now notice in this case that if we're adding a new person, this document ID could be undefined or null or empty or something, right? Because we haven't created that document yet. But that's okay. We can pass an undefined or null because our endpoint already handles that case. So otherwise, we're just passing the same things, first name, last name, email. So this save method handles both create and update. Okay, I told you we're scratching the surface, and that is it with Angular. Any, any questions on that? I think I'm going to convert this into Angular 2 at some point. Anybody interested in Angular, Angular 2 around here? You can maybe help me with that or do it for me? No? Darn it. Okay, so let's go back to C Sharp and look at some more complex nickel. I'm going to switch away from our demo app into a, um, a different set of data, a different bucket. When you install Couchbase Server, you have the option of installing these sample buckets. So if you guys are familiar with Northwind, it's kind of like Northwind, but for Couchbase. One of them is called Travel Sample. It contains 20 to 30,000 documents, all related to travel. So we have uh, airlines, airports, landmarks, routes, things like that are all in there. And it's fairly realistic, I guess. Um, we have some travel uh, agency type customers, so it's fairly realistic. Um, this is just kind of to show off that this is a this is a no joke SQL implementation, right? This is a full SQL implementation, so we can do a union on a NoSQL database. We can say, give me all the airports um, from the sample that are you know, up there. I have the I have these two parameters here: dollar sign one, dollar sign two. So give me the airports for dollar sign one. Give me the airports for dollar sign two. Union them together, and I'll run that into a query request, add my parameters, execute, and I'll get those rows. And what I'll get back looks like this. So I actually executed this in um, the query workbench in Couchbase, which is a tool I can show you here in a second. This is the result. So it's a JSON results, so maybe kind of hard to picture, but you can see that this is an array of two JSON objects, and the fields I selected was FAA, which is like the airport code. And then the geographic coordinates, so altitude, latitude, longitude. It's, it's another field, but it's an embedded object within that field. So here's another view of it here. You can click on the table tab and get something of a tabular representation of it. So here we have two results. One of the, you know, the first row has two fields, and one of those fields has a you know, embedded object in it. Right? You can think of it kind of like a subtable. In fact, if you have an array, it's going to look very much more like a subtable. You'll have rows within rows, kind of, is how you can think about it. I did Port Columbus and Dayton because I wanted to appeal to my audience. Um, all right. Okay, so any questions on that? I'm going to go to a, a lot more complex one, so any questions on this one so far? You guys comfortable with, with regular SQL in here? I, I assume most people are familiar with regular relational SQL. Okay, so now let's do a little more complex query here. I want to find all the routes on a specific day. So um, in, this, in this database, there are routes uh, from airport to airport. Each route has some number of flights in it and some other information about those flights and the routes. So. Um, this is, a, this is a complex query because I'm selecting from multiple aliases up there. It's the same bucket, but I'm aliasing them in different ways because I'm getting different subsets of the same bucket. If you've ever done like a table joined to itself, it's kind of like this, the same sort of thing. I'm, I'm actually unnesting because the schedule field is an array of the times that the plane departs the airports and arrives at the airports. And then I'm joining it to this, its, itself, to the, to the travel sample bucket, to get the name of the airline. So I'm joining it on the airline ID key, which is a document key. So there are some number of documents that are just airlines. And then I'm saying, okay, where is the destination, where it's the source airport, and then which day it is. And those are the parameters I'm putting into the, with the nickel there. 
So I know this might be a little hard to picture, a lot of stuff throwing at you right now. So I want to take a quick second here to walk you through a demo that will hopefully make things a little clearer. So here is the, this is your Couchbase console. I've just clicked on the query tab up there. This is kind of like your SQL Server, you know, workbench sort of, sort of thing. You can enter queries and execute them and see the results. So I'm going to start with something really simple here. I want to select some fields from travel sample. I'm going to alias travel sample as R. And R because I'm interested in routes. Each route has a source airport and destination airport. So in this case, I'm saying, give me the routes from San Francisco to Miami. And then give me those fields from, that, from those documents. Now, I could also say, if I wanted to be more clear, I could say r.type equals route. Because I only want documents that are routes. I don't have to do that in this case, because the only documents that have those fields are, are routes. So I can just go into and omit that. So let's start with that. Very simple. And this is what I would get. I'm getting uh, three rows here. One, two, three rows. So each row has these you know, normal looking fields, airline ID, which is kind of think of like a foreign key to an airline. So this means United Air or American Airlines or something. Destination airport, equipment number, I guess it's the airplane number, I don't know. Uh, some ID here, the source airport, and then here's the schedule field, which is an array of day, flight, time. If I showed you that in JSON, it's a little, it takes a little more screen space. But there's schedule. You can see it's an array of these objects that are day, flight, time. Day, flight, time. So the table's a little more compact. Okay, so that's a little bit of a departure from your normal SQL type query, but is everyone with me so far on this one? Okay, I'm going to add a little wrinkle to it here. Now, in this same bucket, there are other documents that are not routes. They are airlines. They both exist in the same document. I'm going to do a join now, right here. I'm going to join to the same bucket, but I'm going to alias these as A, because these are for airlines. And the way I'm going to join is on those documents' keys. So I have airline ID right here, airline 439. There is a document that has a key of airline 439. So when I join those together, I'm actually going to alias that as A. So then instead of the airline ID, I can get the airline name. All right? Execute. There we go. So instead of that ID, I now have American Airlines because I'm using A.name. So I've joined that together. The, the result is still a JSON array. So over here, you can see name is now American Airlines. But I like showing the table view because it's a little easier to show on one screen I'll visualize. So is everyone following that so far? That may be a little tricky because it is a join because we're joining documents on keys though, not on the, in the fields. We're joining a field to a key with document. Okay. All right. If that wasn't enough, I'm going to throw another wrinkle at you here. Now that schedule field is an array, but suppose I don't want it to be an array. Suppose I want to get the data a little different, differently. I'm going to do what's called an unnest. And this is what makes it a superset. We have additional functionality in here to deal with JSON. You can think of an unnest as sort of a document joining to itself. So what I'm saying is there's unnest that r.schedule field into an s alias. All right. And then when you do that, I want to get the flight and UTC from that unnesting and add them to my select. So any guesses what this is going to look like when I execute it? What's that? More rows. More rows? That's correct. So I have two results here. I execute now and I have 52 results here. So now it's sort of, it's kind of like a left join in the document itself. So you can see a lot of this is the same thing repeated. Destination, equipment, flight. No, flight's not repeated because that's going to be from your schedule. ID, name, source, the time's going to be different. 
So, so there's some extra functionality that to, to deal with JSON. Unnest is just one example of that. And just to finish out the example, let's add another where in there to say, give me the flights that are happening on day zero, which is Sunday, I guess, in the travel industry. They say day zero. So there are my flights from San Francisco to Miami on Sunday. There we go. How do you query? Okay, good question. So you're saying, all right, so let's go back to, let's see if this works. I don't think I've tried this yet, so let's say, go back to this, all right? Now you, you want to say, I want to know, give me the documents that have flights on Sunday or have a flight with AA070, and you want to do a where clause that applies to this, right? Yeah. So there is some additional dotted syntax you can use to do that. I don't know the exact syntax offhand, but it's something like this. You would say uh, r.schedule, um, and it, you, could, you could do, you can, you can use array syntax like this. You can say, give me the first element. Or you can say, and I, don't know the, I don't know the exact syntax. I can look at it for you, but it's something like, um, it's basically a lambda where you say like any, whoops, any schedule, um, I don't know. I don't know the syntax, but it's it's basically a lambda where you say you know, s dot flight equals a a two nine two. That's not the right syntax, but something like that where you can say, you know, give me a document where any one of these has a a zero seven zero. That sort of thing. So it'll return that document to you based on that the, that hierarchy. And that's, that's in the case of array. Again, if it's, your, it's just hierarch hierarchical data, you can use that dotted syntax to say, okay, you know, foo.bar.baz okay, equals whatever. Dot, it's just yes, dot. yes. That's another thing that makes it you know, a superset because that's not in your standard SQL. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing that makes it a superset because that's not in your standard SQL. Not most standard SQLs anyway. Okay, good question. Okay. Any more on this? Um, there is an online interactive nickel tutorial that allows you, it gives you like a sandbox of real data. I think it's travel sample actually. It could be, it could be beer sample, I don't know, one of those two. That just sort of takes you through step by step and, it, and shows you the results. You can experiment with it and you can change things and it'll show you the results. I think there are some things disabled for security reasons, but most of the language is there for you to play with. I'll give you a link to that um, here in a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yes. I, I'm not going to spend much time on in, uh, no time on in indexing today, but indexing is very important, especially in these buckets because it's not just a single table, but it's a bucket of lots of different documents. So it's indexing is very important to get right. Um, I, I'll just say really quickly here, um, you can run and explain on any query. And it will tell you what indexes it used. Uh, so in this case, it looks like it's using an index scan, which is equivalent of a table scan. So um, I think, oh wait, no, no, that's not right. Index scan means that I'm using an index, uh, which is called def source airport. So this travel sample comes with a bunch of pre-installed indexes already, just as examples. Yeah, go ahead. So there, there. So what you're saying is there's a schema in this bucket. There's not a schema imposed by Couchbase. The schema, if there is one, is imposed by you, the developer. Um, that's a very good question. How do you visualize that schema? Um, so this is my, one of my favorite new things of Couchbase is this query workbench. And this is new to Couchbase 4.5. In the Enterprise Edition, if you look down here, there's this bucket analysis. Okay. And so what I just said is that you're, you are imposing the schema on the database, not the other way around, right? Uh, well, no, because well, no, you don't have to tell this ahead of time what the schema is, right? You can store a document of anything you want in here. 
No, you shouldn't. <laughs> you should store some <laughs> consistent, consistent data structures, okay? But let's say you're coming into a new project and it's Couchbase, and you're like, oh, I don't know what this data looks like, right? What you can do is, with Couchbase, you can say, say there's 30,000 documents. You can run a sample of them. Say, give me 1,000 documents. I will analyze them and look at what they have in common and organize them into what are called flavors. Say, there's these airline documents. They have a lot of things in common, including this field type equals airline. And that will give you a way to visualize what kind of documents you have. So over here, if I click this and expand this out, it's going to be hard to see. But it's going to provide some analysis on all the different flavors of documents it finds. So, for instance, up here, it found flavor 1. 21% of the documents it sampled have this flavor. They have type equals airport in common. So chances are these are airport documents. And they have these fields in common, airport names, city, FAA, and so on. Here's another flavor. Uh, these are type equals route. And so on. I think there's probably seven or eight flavors of documents in here. Um, now five, okay. And it found one called airline. And so this by default does a sample of 1,000. You can change that to a higher or lower sample if you want to. That's a good way to get to know your data, what, your, what documents you have in there. Um, so does that, does that answer your question? Is that yeah, what we're looking for? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you have to use this analysis and figure this out, yeah. And, and Yes, def definitely. You, you, you can't just store whatever you want in there. You have to apply all, some discipline. It's mediated by magic strings. Say that again? It's all the schema that you're imposing on your database is all intermediated by the use of magic strings as opposed to tables. So you're, you're saying the magic strings equal type equals something? Okay, so, so that, that's, that's fair enough criticism. There are some other tools out there that'll, that will give you some help with that, uh, which I, I actually want to show you a small bit of that. Uh, here today called link to Couchbase, where you don't have to worry about that as much. You don't have to, you know, you define a type and it's going to store that type with some metadata and handle that for you. So, but yeah, it's a fair criticism. It's, you get more control, um, uh, but you have to, you know, use some more rigor in that control. So, it's a fair point. Yeah, go ahead. So, like, hypothetically speaking, let's, let's say you didn't have, you know, type equals airline. Anything, yeah. If you didn't have that type field, would, would that bucket analysis, though, still roughly look the same? Yeah, yeah, it would. It, yes, right. So it would still find the airport name is in common, city names in common among all those different documents. Absolutely. And there's going to be some tolerance there. So your documents, you know, you shouldn't necessarily always do this, but one airline you store could have different fields than another airline you store. So they have some things in common, but not necessarily everything's in common, right? And it's not imposed, it's just a sample. Here's what we think are some flavors of documents in there. Okay. All right, so this is the source code for the sample app I showed you with Angular and .NET. There's, it's on Couchbase Lab. There's great stuff out there too for Node and for Java and other type of projects that are, are pretty cool. You can check it out on, on GitHub. Everything Couchbase does is open source, um, server, and the mobile stuff I'll show you later. Everything's open source. And here is a link to that tutorial I mentioned. It's online interactive tutorial for Nickel. So you can work through that and it'll take you through all the steps from very beginning up to you know, the more complicated stuff. Okay, and let's talk briefly about link to Couchbase. So if you guys are familiar with Entity Framework, or and hibernates, they are ORMs that work with your, your relational databases. So it's not a relational database, we don't have an ORM, but we have something called an ODM, Object Data Model. One we have for .NET is called Link to Couchbase. It's a full link provider for Couchbase. Um, it's not yet officially supported by Couchbase. It's an open source project. It might be supported sometime in the future. So this is a way you could use Link to Couchbase. You could define a POCO-like airline here. And you could give it an attribute, say a document type filter, which that's optional. We'll see why in a second. 
And then you can also give it properties that correspond to the document that you are storing. Right? And uh, unfortunately, the travel sample uses this sort of camel case um, casing because, uh, I don't know, that's what JavaScript people do. Um, so I have to use JSON property to say, no, it's actually lowercase name, not uppercase name. Um, same thing with type. And then uh, the, the key is going to be stored in the ID string, so I, wanna, I don't want to actually serialize the key into the document, so I put an ignore on that. Okay, so that's a plain old uh, CLR object. And then I can use link to Couchbase to do something like this. I can say, uh, well, it's db here, but it would be bucket.query. And give me uh, all the documents of type airline. And then select the name from those airlines. So this will give me all the airline names in the, in the bucket. Now, that line I have crossed out there, you don't need that as long as you have the attribute up there with airline in it. So if, there, if that attribute exists, link to Couchbase will say, all right, I'll automatically add type equals airline to that query. If you don't have that, that's fine. You just have to remember to put in type equals airline in there. And this is a, a, a very good link implementation, so you get all the where stuff, you get all the selects and uh, all that other, other stuff. I've, uh, this is the link syntax. I don't like as much as the extension syntax, but both are supported. All right, so that's all I have for Couchbase Server. Uh, I have some material for Couchbase Mobile, if you guys are interested. If we have time, I'll leave it up to you. I'm seeing a, one head nodding yes. Okay, mobile, okay. Uh, are we, how are we doing on time, what time is it? Okay, all right. Okay, if you guys have server questions as we go, that's fine, go ahead and keep asking them, but I'm gonna start on some mobile stuff now. That's right, we're still waiting on the pizza, aren't we? Yeah. All right. This is all very cool, and I don't have a ton of uh, non experience, so yeah. forgive me. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Uh, the thing that uh, sounds like a weakness also sounds like a strength also. So just for me, at my experience level, it does look like I can put all the documents I want in. Yes. I could have one odd document that I accidentally got in. Sure. Uh, and those would just be sitting out there, right? So, yes. So it really doesn't impose anything at all. I mean, I can that's right. That uh, well, it may sound like a, a weakness the way I'm describing it. That really is the beauty of it, isn't it? I can put all that I want in it. I yeah. can just keep throwing data at right. it. Right, right. So, yeah, so what you're, what you're talking about is that, you know, you can store a document of anything you want in there. And, it, and, this, and the database isn't going to say, no, you can't store that. Right. You can add, you know, you can, I'm storing those airline documents. If I want to add a new field, I don't have to say, okay, alter table, add new column, things like that. I can just go ahead and store that, store that column. So it's a very astute observation. You say it's the weakness and the strength. It is definitely a trade-off there. And there's definitely a difference between relational databases and, and NoSQL non-relational databases. I find that's a different way of thinking. Yes, it is a different way of thinking, absolutely. And that's why I said up front that, you know, there's no silver bullet here. I mean, if this doesn't fit your requirements, don't use it just because it's cool or anything like that, you know? You have a question, yeah. Let's go back to what you were saying about able to put in any kind of documents. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. There's nothing magical about that type field. It's just arbitrary field that I chose to to delineate those documents. So you could store. You don't have to put it in there. You could put. You could make it called foo. You could do whatever you want with that document. Yeah. 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 So is there a place where you tell the system how to how I how does it know that it's an airline? How does it know that you got to go to the type to determine that this is an airline document? So that's up to you to make that. Is that a configuration? Yeah, well, it's not a configuration. It's, that's something that you are doing. You're saying type equals airline has meaning to me in my application. Right? The database is just thinking that's another field. I'm okay with that. Uh, I guess I would, I'm maybe thinking about the, the, type, the name of the type field. I mean, what can we do some other field to determine what kind of document yeah. it is? Yeah, that's up, that's up to you. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right. Okay. Good questions. All right, so now for something completely different, We're talking about Couchbase Mobile. There are three parts, and these are, again, all open source. Couchbase Lite, which is an embedded mobile database, NoSQL. Sync Gateway, which uh, these are all kind of optional, right? You don't have to use them all together. Sync Gateway will sync up your data from your mobile devices to other devices and optionally to a Couchbase server cluster. Uh, Couchbase Lite, you can think of this kind of like a, a replacement for SQLite. 
in your, in your mobile apps, your Android, iOS, and so on. Um, Android, iOS are officially supported. I don't know about the rest of them being officially supported, but I know it all works on Unity, Xamarin, PhoneGap, and uh, you know, even if you're running a Linux or a Mac OS X app or, or a desktop app, you can use an embedded database in there if you wanted to. IoT, another uh, use case for this. Sync Gateway, this synchronizes data to and from those databases on the mobile devices. Um, so the Sync really has no idea about the devices, so you don't have to tell Sync Gateway, oh, these 10 devices. Instead, it's the other way around. You tell the device, oh, here's your Sync Gateway, you know, sync up to it. We'll see an example of that uh, in a second here. Um, you can use Facebook Auth, Persona, your own auth authentication for this. Those are all available. And Couchbase Server, you can hook up to Sync Gateway to store your data, um, persist your data into a, a cloud somewhere. Okay, so Couchbase Lite is a relatively small footprint. We're talking maybe 400K for your application. Uh, it starts its own little web server, actually, in your app. So hypothetically, um, no one's ever done this yet, but you could set up a peer-to-peer -peer sort of thing with your, your NoSQL databases on your devices. Um, these four icons mean that it's NoSQL. You get MapReduce, you get eventing, and the syncing. So we'll talk about all those things. Here's a snippet of code here. I thought I would use Xamarin since this is a .NET group, but also works with Android or, or Objective-C and all that sort of stuff. Uh, in this case, I'm saying, okay, give me a database called mgrows-database. So if it already exists, it's going to get access to that. Otherwise, it'll create that database on your device. Once I have that database, I'll create a document on the database. Okay, once I have the document, put some properties in there. I'm just going to throw in a dictionary of string, uh, a dictionary here of all those different fields there. It's going to get serialized to JSON just like it does in uh, Couchbase Server. And so once you've done that, it's done. You've saved your object to your local database, and there you go. Uh, it generates an ID uh, for you. You can also specify an ID if you want, but this is the sort of built-in, you know, generates an ID automatically. Talk about MapReduce. So this is just like the MapReduce on Couchbase server, kind of. But you can build indexes in your own language that you're using. So with Couchbase server, you've got to build them in JavaScript. With Couchbase Lite, you can build them in C Sharp or in um, uh, Java or whatever you're using to write your code. And the benefit of this is that you can actually set breakpoints in your MapReduce because it's just code that you've written in your application. And the results of that get persisted, so it's a nice and fast query. MapReduce is just a function, basically. Here's how you create a view. Um, so I start by saying db.getView, and that's going to create the people view if one doesn't already exist. And then you say, okay, set the mapping, the MapReduce function on that. And in this case, I've just done a lambda. And the lambda contains a document and an emit function. So it's going to go through each document in the database and run this MapReduce. And my MapReduce code says, okay, if the document has the key Twitter, then emit it. That, that's the document I want to emit as a key value pair, the, the key of the document and the document itself. If it doesn't contain Twitter, then I'm not going to emit it. So what this means is that if you don't have a Twitter account, you're not a person. <laughs> and then uh, to execute the view, I say get the existing view. It has the name there. Create a query and run the query. There are some other options here. You can run it asynchronously. You can also run it as an observable, which we'll see if, if my demo works here. Um, so you can do some cool stuff with your UI on your mobile. And then just with those rows, I'll loop through them. I could print them out or display them on the screen, that sort of thing. Uh, with change notifications, instead of polling your database over and over for see if something's changed, you can just set up a change event. And so this cuts down on, on a lot of your sort of cruft that you'd see in your SQLite uh, querying type stuff. You can listen for changes in data, uh, listen for changes in queries. You can listen for changes everywhere in your database and then respond to those changes. So here is an example of that. This looks like your standard sort of Windows eventing model here. I'd say, so this I'm setting up the DB changed event. That's if anything in the database changes, I'll fire this event. And then I get this database change event args, which has a property called changes. And that is an array. 
So you can get a whole batch of changes at once. It's not just one at a time. You're responding to some collection of changes. And then you can do, you know, find out what kind of change it is. So is this a conflict in synchronization? Or is this a delete change? And then based on what it is, you can then respond. You can say, okay, it's a conflict, so tell the user, you know, you need to resolve this conflict, or just use the newest one, or whatever you want to do. Or if it's a delete, you may want to send a push notification somewhere. That's, that's going to be up to you to do whatever you want to those changes. In this case, I just want to log the document ID. That it, was, it was a conflict. Synchronization. So if you set up Couchbase Sync Gateway, you can get a full multi-master replication. And that's a fancy way of saying that each Couchbase Lite instance will get all the data. So if, you're, if you have your phone and you just install the app, it's going to sync to the Sync Gateway and give you all the data to your phone. So each the full database is stored on each phone. You have some battery drain options, which I'll show you here, and change notification and conflict detection. So one of the things about syncing devices is that if a device goes offline, you can still make changes to the database. When it comes back online, that could result in a conflict. So you need to have an ability to figure out what to do with those conflicts. And Sync Gateway does not make any assumptions, so you have to tell it how you want to resolve those conflicts. So that's up to you. Here's an example of how you'd set up Sync Gateway on your mobile device. You could just say, I want to do push replication or pull replication, or you can do both. Give it the address of the Sync Gateway. Uh, the continuous option there is your sort of way you can deal with battery. You can say, I want to continuously pull for synchronization. That's going to drain more battery. And then you can just kick them off by starting each of them. So that is going to sync the databases behind the scenes. You're still going to interact with your database on a local basis. It's going to write to your device no matter what. So it's an offline first strategy there. You don't have, you know, if the, if the internet service is down or you're out of cell phone range, it'll still work. Okay, here's this fancy slide which takes forever to load. Um, these are some places you can get Couchbase Lite. I don't know what those two on the left are. Some sort of Java thing, I guess. Uh, you can get it on NuGet, you get it on NPM if you guys are into Node, and it's on GitHub, it's open source. So, let's cross my fingers here and try to do a demo. This demo is a little bit complex, so let me just sort of walk you through it here. I'm going to start by opening PowerShell. Uh, well, it's already failing, great. Let's start by PowerShell as an administrator. Okay, great. If you guys can't see that, it's not terribly important. Um, Zproj, and then it's called To Do Xamarin Forms. This is all available on GitHub. What I have in here is, if you can't read it, there's a sync gateway config JSON file. So this is how I'm configuring my sync gateway. So to kick that off, I'll just say program files, couchbase, sync gateway, and then I'll give it that sync gateway config json file. Let's see if that works. All right, so far so good. Now I'm going to load up a couple of mobile apps inside of VMs here on this machine using a tool called Genymotion. Are you guys familiar with that at all? Anybody do mobile development? So I'm using Android for this example and the stock Android emulator is just atrociously slow. Just a nightmare. So Genymotion is actually kind of a wrapper around VirtualBox that allows you to do uh, Android VMs relatively quickly. I should have done this before I started the demo because I'm just kind of stalling for time now. But I have on these app, on these devices, I have this to-do light Xamarin Forms app, which is just the, I compiled and deployed them earlier to these, uh, to these phones two different phones here and they both know about sync gateway so I'm going to open the app here and open the app here okay so these are two different VMs you'll have to take my word for that here is the credentials to log into sync gateway so I'll log in there log in there okay so now you can see in the background on PowerShell some stuff with sync gateways happening oh are you kidding me I just tried this before I left. I just did, I swear. Okay, so it's, hold, hold. 
Um, so it's, it's talking to Sync Gateway and it's doing some activity back there. Normally you wouldn't run it as a console app, it'd be a Windows service or whatever. Um, <laughs> this is by far the most troublesome demo. Let's see if we can do it real fast. Okay, so this is, this is just a to-do list on, uh, on both sides. So I'll say Dayton.net. I'll create a list here. And if this works correctly, it should show up on the other VM, syncing automatically. And I could then go and do the same thing over here and create list, and it's going to show up on the other one. There we go. Ama amazing. It's a miracle. Um, so that's what you're doing. You're just using Sync Gateway. And right now, this is not backed by Couchbase Server. This is all in memory, Sync Gateway, because I haven't connected them up. So once I shut down Sync Gateway and these two machines, because remember, the full database is stored on them, then all that data is gone. So you probably want to hook that up to a, a persistent store um, like Couchbase Server. It's not crashing so far. It's great. Okay, so that... If I took down the server, uh, I think so. I think so. Do you want to try it? No, 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 that's up to you. If you need more problems, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there, I just took down the, oh, well, actually, it's not down just yet. Because it's still running as a service, I think. Hey, it's fine. We're going to, oh, it is down. Okay, good. We're just going to go crazy. We're going to go off the rails and see what happens. So if I go here and here, and then if I go back and load them again, they're still there. Does that prove it? I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. So there are the servers down. Let's double check. Okay. I think that's, that's down. Where's the refresh button on here? Yep. Okay. It's down. So you're saying add one over here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. And then uh, bring up this one here, yeah. okay. And then you're saying, go ahead and crank, crank up the sync gateway. And then let's see what happens. It may have to log back into sync gateway, um, just because the way this app is written. Let's try it. No, I didn't have to log back in. Doesn't seem to be doing it. But I may have it set up wrong, so you're still impressed? I'm still impressed. Yeah, because uh, that leaves me with the notion that. Huh. Okay. But you're saying that, the, that it's distributed and that each one gets a copy from the other, and there's yes. a potential that, disregarding this screen right here, yeah. that it, we may be able to uh, just get a full copy. If I, even if I lose my server, because yeah. the server's in the distributed environment, the servers are right. Un right. unavailable. Right. And you're going to be making changes, then we're going to hook up, and I'm going to get my data. Right, exactly. And as I said before, each of these sort of spin up their own web server. So hypothetically, you could do a peer to peer and just skip the sync gateway completely. I don't know anybody has done that yet, but it's hypothetically it's possible. That has pretty cool potential for local games, uh, for example. I mean, right. I'm just making that up, but if I show up in the house and the kids are in there with their kids, then suddenly we would appear together and maybe we could interact sure. locally just sure. because we have a So I, I worked on a mobile app for, um, uh, well, I won't say, but. Uh, they, they wanted their content to be available even when they were in, they were in rural areas where they didn't have signal. Um, and we had this Rube Goldberg sort of mechanism of, we, you know, we'd save it to a SQL server and there'd be a job that would run and it would post it as a zip file with a SQLite database and that would get downloaded and unzipped and loaded into the app. And it would have been done in like a day with this, I think. So I didn't know about this at the time, though, so well, what are you going to do? All right, so that's sync away. I'm not really the mobile guy, if you haven't noticed, by the way. I'm more of the server guy. Uh, if you have mobile questions, I definitely know the mobile guy. Um, I can put you in touch with him. Okay, so that's all the mobile I think I want to mess with for now. I will show you some links. If you're interested, so there's the Xamarin app. There's also one for native script. If you guys are into Telerik native script, there's an example for that out there that I use. There's also, I think, a Java example, an iOS example, all that sort of stuff is out there on Couchbase Labs. Some cool stuff out there. Okay, that's all I got. Um, these are some cool Couchbase logos, and I have some of these in sticker form. Come see me afterwards if you want one. 
Here is uh, where you can talk to us. Our developer portal, our blog. We have some Twitter accounts there. There's my Twitter account, M Groves. If you want to follow me or bother me or whatever. I work in a basement at home, so send me a cat picture or something. Make my day. Uh, forums, if you have really tough questions, I might send you there to ask the engineers. Uh, and also Stack Overflow, we watch that as well. That's it. So you guys got any questions? Yeah. You said this was open source. That's true. That's true. What do I have to pay for? <laughs> so uh, Couchbase Server is, uh, there, there's two editions. There's a community edition, which is totally free. Free as in beer, free as in speech, open source. Um, usually it's released a version behind the Enterprise Edition. So right now Enterprise is 4.5 and Community is 4.1. So some of those features will be you know, not quite there yet. Additionally, the Enterprise Edition has some extra features that will not be available in the, in the Community Edition, even when it does catch up. So like I showed you the, the um, what was it, the Bucket Analyzer? That's an Enterprise Edition feature. But we do have plenty of people using Couchbase uh, community in production. Um, so I would, you know, also if you're just interested in playing with those Enterprise Edition features, go ahead and download it and use it. If Don't put it into production, you don't have to pay a license fee for it. So go ahead and get it and download it and play with it. That's totally fine. Uh, mobile, I'm not sure their, their licensing model. I, I think they're pretty much on par right now, both Enterprise and community. So the only difference I think would be support in that case. Yeah. Tooling for refactoring your type names. So if you want to go into that database, mm -hmm. do a refactor, rename. Rename. So you could just run an update query in nickel and uh, you know, say set, you know, set this field equal to this other field's value. Change type names in nickel. Uh, so there, I mean, by type, do you mean just the, the fields, the JSON field names? Is that what you're talking about? Or? Well, if you want them to have a type, a field called type, yes, yeah. yeah. Can you change that using nickel? Yes, yes. You can do an update query to change the field values, add new fields, all that sort of thing. Absolutely. Cool. Is the pizza here yet? All right. I'm not going to keep you any longer, guys. Thank you. <laughs>